say hello to Jeff Howe, NFL National Insider for The Athletic. You can give him a follow on Twitter at Jeff P. Howe. Jeff, good morning. Thanks for joining us, man. All right, thanks for having me. Of course. What's up? It's uh, up? So we're in D.C., and the Commanders are sitting currently with the number two pick in the 2024 NFL Draft. That dovetails nicely with one of your most recent articles put out March 2nd about the NFL Combine quarterback rankings. How do executives, coaches view the top six prospects? You have Caleb Williams at one, Drake May at two, Jaden Daniels at three. I'm just going to dismiss Caleb right now. I'm going to assume he is picked by the Bears at number one. Which quarterback makes the most sense, in your opinion, and the opinion of these experts that you talked with, for the commanders sitting at number two? Well, the belief around the league, now keep in mind, this is not coming from the commanders, but the belief around the league is that the commanders are higher, or pretty high on May. And that's what they assume is going to be the pick at two. And the majority of people I spoke with, and it was a lot of people, I mean, that was my number one question for everybody I met last week was, uh, you know, again, give me your rankings. Tell me who you like and, and where the tiers are, where there's a drop-off. And, and the majority of the people still favor May over Daniels. And that was the case for the entirety of the college football season. It was always Caleb Williams, Drake May, 1-2, and then there was the drop-off. Now, Jaden Daniels has done a lot over the course of his game tape. And since then, and, and I think people kind of catching up to his improvements over the last two years to close that gap, and there are certainly people around the league who have Daniels as the number two guy. But uh, I think the safer pick is probably May, but that's that's not a knock on Daniels. You know, it's not, you, you don't have to take one and hate the other or vice versa. Right. Uh, with May, you've got a guy who is listed 6'4", 230, has a massive arm. The Justin Herbert comparisons have sort of become a cliche, but, like, every time I've talked to somebody about uh, May since probably October Justin Herbert has been brought up just because of that arm strength uh, great kid, great leader has some mobility to his game so those are all the pluses, the minuses are he had some inconsistent game tape last year there were games uh, when he was downright bad and that's coming straight from the words of uh, NFL executives who have watched it so uh, there is a little bit of a concern that he struggled against some ACC defenses and, you know, that's not necessarily ideal. Mm -hmm. But you, you look at everything that he's got and, and the tools and the qualities, and that, there's a big reason why he's viewed widely as the number two. Now, if you like Daniels, I mean, there's, there's a lot to love there, too. And the number one thing that people bring up, it's not the electric running ability, although that's high on the list. Mm -hmm. It's the incredible improvement that he's made over his two seasons at LSU mm -hmm. uh, to get himself into this position. And it's like, okay, well, if he can improve this much at LSU against those defenses over the last two years, what's his trajectory going to be when he gets to the NFL? Is that improvement going to keep in, in that same sort of trajectory? And if it does, you know, you could be looking at somebody who three, four years from now is like, oh, my goodness, how wasn't he the number one pick? Like, that's how high his ceiling is. Uh, we'll see if he's able to get there. You know, the knock on Jaden Daniels is, yeah, he's a terrific runner and he is a good passer, but he's still got to anticipate a little better. Not that that's not a knock or a, a bit of a, a mark against just about everybody who comes out of college. But, you know, you want him to anticipate and see the field better. But the other side of that is because he's so mobile, because he's so great at extending plays, he should be able to buy some time and start day one as everything else sort of slows down around him. And then the other big knock that you're going to hear quite a bit about is the frame. And right. it would have been really fun to see him weigh in at the combine. I can sort of understand why he didn't. And, and teams will get their chances at the top 30 visits or at the pro day, whatever comes first, um, or, you know, whatever they get the chance to do. They <laughs> believed he was going to be at 6'3", close to 200 pounds. I know LSU listed him at 210, and we can all kind of laugh at how those listings are. And who knows, maybe there was a little uh, – Inflation there with May's numbers at North Carolina, but hmm. six three two hundred is is certainly a concern. But you know what? Like I went into this asking from a Patriots perspective, just because I was always taught up in the Foxborough area, if you have a New England quarterback, you want this guy to be big, you want him to have some muscle mass, you want him to be able to throw it so it can cut through these the, the December or January winds. And I asked, is the size of the problem with Jaden Daniels? And and I got flatly turned down just about every time I ask that. So uh, I don't see why that would be an issue in D.C. 
Well, somebody did describe him to me. I thought it was hilarious uh, yesterday as uh, Johnny Knoxville. Like his collisions. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? They're, right. like, they're jackass-like mm-hmm. with right. the hits that he takes. I actually love Daniels. I, he's, to me, the most explosive player potentially in this draft, the most exciting. You know, he yeah, he get L- Lamar vibes, obviously, with the way he runs and he's able to throw the deep ball, et cetera, right? I think he's a super exciting prospect. But I, I went on the air and I told a story that I labeled as gossip multiple times that I had heard that, there were, that Peters had a fifth-round uh, grade on him a year or so ago, and that's probably not surprising, right? I bet a lot of GMs. Had a, probably a fit like this guy's. You kind of touch on it. His rise over the last two years has been pretty incredible. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's and that's the exciting thing about draft season is that you never really know who's going to be that guy. I mean, look at Joe Burrow five years ago. I mean, mm-hmm. going into his senior season or his last season in college, uh, he was a total afterthought, and he he rose so high that he was the number one pick, and it was like, wait, is everybody overthinking it? And then he's, he's really just solidified himself with, with that status since he's gotten to the NFL. So, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think you ever want to get caught up in, well, what did he look like a year ago? Because uh, then you start to say, well, I mean, shoot, look at some of the, like, Bo Nix was like a, a massive recruit going into Auburn, and uh, hasn't necessarily had that perfect college drive. Doesn't mean he's a bad player. Well, like Rattler, right? Everybody said Rattler. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I think you take the rise and the progress and, and you appreciate that more than saying, uh, wait, are we overthinking a guy who wasn't necessarily so high on board a year ago? Talking to Jeff Howell, uh, insider for the NFL for the Athletics. So, um, getting back to Daniels, if he did come in at 6'3 and a half, right, if they if – they, Measured him at six three and, a half, and like one ninety eight or one ninety nine. How much do you think he would drop? You think he would drop at all? I, so it's that's a tough one because it's like uh, I think from the NFL circles, I don't think that would change much, if anything, because I think there's just been so much work done. Uh, then you look at the drop; it's like the group think mock draft stuff, yeah. and you know you, you get the mock drafts where you have people who don't necessarily you know talk to. Uh, people around the league and you just sort of form the consensus. I mean, I know when uh, it's speaking anecdotally, when Dane Brugler from the athletic released the mock draft a few months ago, and he was the first guy to have Jaden Daniels in the top half of the first round. And then all of a sudden you look at every other mock draft and all of a sudden he's in the top half of everybody's first round. And then you've got people saying, well, if he can go 12, why can't he go two? So uh, there's, there's a drop from like the mock draft crowd. And then there's a drop from like the NFL crowd. And uh, I'm, I always try to be careful to distinguish between the two because I think, again, I, I, I try as I – because I focus so much on quarterbacks throughout the regular season in college and uh, NFL and then into draft season because I want to hear consistency. It's not like, um, you know, we get past the Super Bowl and now all of a sudden I start asking around and I, I try to formulate my opinions there because – you know, everybody says it. It's lying season, and there's a lot of truth to that, and that's why I want to hear from people I know who are going to give me consistent answers, and if once I start to hear things change, for better or worse, then I start to formulate my own opinions on that. So uh, it, it's, it's all about, in my personal opinion, just trying to stay in tune as consistently throughout the year as possible uh, so you don't get trapped or duped by somebody. So based on the people that you talk to, is Caleb Williams the number one overall, like not even close prospect? Or do you, do you still talk to some people who go, no, nah, I like May one or I like Daniels one? Or was Williams the overwhelming, clear-cut, nobody's even close to him at number one? I wouldn't – you know, there are some people who say – I wouldn't say necessarily say not even close, uh, but it's like – I mean, shoot, you'll, you will find some people who think that. Um but, you know, it's not, there, there are certainly concerns. Like, how much is the outside influence from his circle? Like, is he getting bad information from people? Uh, not uh, doing the medicals at the combine, even though I, I certainly understood his explanation. You know, when you are the first person who doesn't want to do something, whether it's ever or in a very long time, people are going to wonder why. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's the wrong decision. It just means, okay, you need to – you need to continue to back that up. You need to continue provide, to provide the answers why to make people in the NFL to understand and be comfortable. And uh, so he's making some non-traditional decisions, and they're trying to make sure um, they they understand the why between some of the things that you've seen uh, in the media or in certain articles or whatever over the past year or so. 
Uh, the talent is unquestionable, and I think if you look at just what he's able to do uh, as a quarterback, yeah, you could say that there's a pretty big gap. But if this game were just all about talent, I mean, Jamarcus Russell would be in the Hall of Fame. So you've got to make sure. And I'm not, I don't want to. I don't want to make it sound like I'm comparing Caleb Williams to Jamarcus Russell. That's just a pure talent thing. You've got to make sure that these guys come in and they check every other box too. Jeff, do you see one of these handful of teams sitting between 6 and 20, where the Giants are at 6, Steelers at 20, moving up to 4, where the Cardinals are sitting right now, but to draft either a J.J. McCarthy or a Bo Nix, one of those next tier down from the clear top three? Or do they feel like McCarthy's going to be available there at like 8 or 10? How do you see that playing out? I think if a team really likes McCarthy and the amount of positive things I've heard about him over the past week uh, from so many different people, you know, saying, hey, wait for Saturday when he throws, that's when his stock is really going to start to to rise uh, publicly. And and it has. I mean, it's held true. So I think if somebody wants McCarthy, they're more than likely going to have to trade up to get him. Now, if that's the Falcons at eight and they don't want to get leapfrogged by somebody, yeah, maybe they do start talking to the Cardinals at four or the Chargers at five or the Giants at six. Uh, So I could, uh, I was absolutely told by multiple people that McCarthy's ceiling is in the top five, whether that's four or five. Now we'll see if that's how it all sort of comes to roost here. You got to look at the pro days and and everything else that's going to come with it over the next month and a half. Uh, But I, I thought because you've got about five teams in that range from eight to 13 or so you've got I think five teams that you can talk yourself into thinking that they're going to win a quarterback you could even go into the second half you know the top of the second half of the first round and some teams there who could uh, be considering moving up and if they really like McCarthy a lot more than Knicks or vice versa I mean right now it, it tends to be McCarthy over Knicks if they really like that guy and they don't want to miss out on him they're going to have to move up for him so I'm not sure how high it's going to be but I would be surprised if whoever gets McCarthy does just stays pat I think there's going to be some movement. I think that's where the fun part of the draft is going to begin. It'll be interesting to see, you know, you take Atlanta out of that mix if Cousins signs there. Um, But in terms of the Bears, and I do believe that Caleb goes one to the Bears. If I had to put money on it, going to the window right now, Caleb to the Bears. What makes sense for for Justin Fields in terms of other teams, in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the tricky one. Uh, You so I did a story about that last week, and I, I talked to, I believe it was eight people, and they, the majority believed that he was going to end up being worth about a second-round pick, maybe a third. And it, it's all about the supply and the demand on that, of course. I think at this point, the Falcons, the Bucks, and the, um, the Vikings, you know, whether it's keeping Cousins and Mayfield or one of those guys going to Atlanta, I think at some point they're going to realize uh, – whether they need to move on to plan B and whether plan B is Justin Fields or just kind of hanging tight and going the draft route, uh, then you could look at a team like, you know, I don't know if Denver would necessarily be in play. They've got a lot of financial stuff to work through. The Raiders are another team that could be in play for Fields. Again, if you don't want to, you don't want to give up a couple first round picks to move Mm-mm. into the you know high into the top 10 to draft somebody like McCarthy. If you're not necessarily sold on him, then it's time to start coming up with a contingency plan and say, well, do I want to trade two ones or do I want to stay here at 12 or 13 or what have you and then just give up a two and take my chances on fields? I mean, if the evaluation on the player is comparable, I think that makes the most sense just in terms of what you're you're exporting there. So uh, he's he's got an interesting market, and it's – again, I I would guess it's going to be a second-round pick from somebody, but let's say all of a sudden, like, the veteran market shakes out and and – you've got teams that maybe they're not so desperate to add a veteran and they're more comfortable waiting on this draft class, then maybe that that uh, that price drops a little bit. Jeff, it was supposed to be a pretty decent free agent wideout class, but then T. Higgins and Pittman both get franchise tagged by their respective teams. Mike Evans gets re-upped <clears throat> in Tampa. Now teams are sifting through, like, Calvin Ridley and Curtis Samuel. Now, that's offset by it's a really loaded wideout class in the draft, but if you're looking for a free agent – wide receiver picking seem a little bit slim at this point yeah yesterday was a very uh difficult day for teams that might be players in the wide receiver market i mean it's just like you said you you ran through that list pretty well there there's not 
there's not a lot. I mean, you could look at Hollywood Brown. You could look at Calvin Ridley. I mean, those are probably the two best. But you know what? Those are guys who have been recently traded uh, or traded not all that long ago for for a reason. And if they don't re-sign with their teams, then you, you're, you're talking about, okay, well, what's the problem here? I mean, as the saying goes, if there's somebody in free agency, there's, they're probably not necessarily a perfect type of player. There are obviously exceptions to that rule, but uh, it's, it's tough if you are if you're a team with a lot of cap space and you were hoping to overspend on a wide receiver now you're talking about giving number one money to uh one of the two or three number twos that are out there or you're giving 11 to 14 million a year to a guy who is probably a number three and you're just hoping you can develop into a number two but i mean when you miss you know, just I'll use the Patriots as an example again. They mm-hmm. went with Juju Smith-Schuster instead of Jacoby Myers last year. That was a miss, and that's that's a significant amount of of money to to spend on a guy who you were hoping was going to be a number two, and then had a tough time staying on the field for much of the season. Mm-hmm. Jeff, thanks so much for the time, man. We really appreciate it. Jeff Howe, NFL National Insider for the Athletic. Check out his work. How do executives, coaches view? the top six quarterback prospects. Thanks again. Of course. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Have a good one. Thank you, buddy. at Jeff P. Howe on Twitter. When we come back, where does Saquon Barkley land? The Giants Mm. are not going to put the franchise tag on him. Could he be a good fit here with the Washington Commanders? We'll talk about that next on The Fan. 